of Candid, where we have real talks with real people. I'm your host, Shanae, and I'm here with Bethany, Dudley, and Jade. Unfortunately, Anissa is not with us today, but she'll probably be with us again next week or week after next. So we've been on a little break, but it feels great to be here with you guys. I've missed you, you know, on this Labor Day weekend. Loads of things have been happening over the last two weeks when we haven't um, recorded in the country, both good and bad. First thing that I saw when I went um, scouring news, all that grabbed my attention was that we have the Prime Minister, the Honorable Philip Brave Davis. Anyway, he revealed that the government has attracted nearly $2 billion worth of investments to the country in the last eight months. And he said that the government seeks to ensure that the concessions offered to these investors will match the level of economic investment and to ensure that they are positive and have a meaningful impact on the community. And this is a direct quote from that he made from Eyewitness. And it says, this is not an adversarial process. We are just committed to making sure that promises made to Bahamians on paper actually materialize in our communities as real and, tan- and tangible benefits. In the past, concessions offered to investors have sometimes exceeded the economic benefits of the investment to the country. No more will this be the case. Davis also noted, also noted that it is the goal of his administration to ensure that the country moves toward a tax system that is more efficient and more equitable. Um, and they said that they already started um, working on this with their revenue enhancement unit um, in regards to our real property tax and trying to make it more equitable. What are you guys thoughts on this investment? Um, because I know in the past with previous governments, especially with the, um, I think was, his name is Toby Smith and he's a Bohemian and he's, he was fighting for, to take over you know, the lighthouse turn it into something and but there was some other investor I mean it was a whole big thing that's been going on for years so that's a prime example of I guess choosing foreign investors over I guess a Bahamian and it not being beneficial necessarily beneficial to the country so what do you guys think do you think this administration is going to remain true to that promise that these so-called investments from foreigners are going to be more equitable and and going to benefit Bahamians and not just in employment, but in other ways? I always look at foreign investment. Whenever governments say that we're going to look for more foreign investment, the main thing that I always worry about is all of it going, is all of it's going to go back into tourism because I understand. It's our number one industry, our bread and butter. It's what we're known for. You know, a lot of people around the world say, hey, man, it's so nice. Oh, my goodness. I And you hear all these great reviews about their time in the Bahamas. But I think that um, allowing Bahamians <laughs> to run things in the Bahamas is, is a lot more important. Because I think foreign investors are going to do what they want to do with the with the uh, with the allowances that we give them and we benefit them a lot more because at some point that money is going to leave the country. I, I am not the most optimistic. I, right now, you know, I going off of what previous governments have done. However, I am willing to see how the how we look a year from now. <laughs> and I hope I hope that we're gonna be in a better place financially. Um, for me, I think when you look at even American history or any country's history, there was a time when that country knew that they needed to invest in themselves and make lucrative investments to kind of ramp up um, the any industry they were interested in and basically support their country and they had to believe in themselves and help help you know their countrymen to you know make something of themselves and i think with this initiative and this plan from what we know (laughs) i think it gives a lot of behemoths the opportunity to actually do something with the ideas that they have now and you know it's we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but for the plans that they're giving us now, it looks promising. And I know as a country, we've been bamboozled 
built over and over and over and over and over again, countless times. But I think this too kind of prompts you to say, well, this time around, we need to demand that these things are followed through. And if they aren't, like, let's not just say, oh, let's push it to FNM now. Let, no, let's do something about it. And even behemoths, you know, when it comes to supporting ourselves, we had, um, we had conversations about this when we spoke about the orange economy and how sometimes it's so hard to gain support from, from locals. And so even, even um, initiatives like that and, and small, small stepping stones that we take can make the whole country better. I mean, it's not gonna be something that, that changes overnight. Of, of course, that's, that would be kind of crazy to think that. But I would say for me, I am somewhat of on the side of um, duds because it's like, yeah, we've heard the promises before, we've seen them in the news, but I think it's up to us to always keep on them and keep and, and allow them to fulfill the, I, I'm going to be the one to allow them to either fulfill their promise or let me down. And I'm hoping that they do the first instead of the latter, but, I mean, I kind of like how, how the country is going with, I think this, this government thinks a lot of about the Bahamian people. Um, when he speaks, I think it's a, it's, it's a vast difference from, from the last government. I can honestly say that when it comes to the, the presentation they, they give to the Bahamian people. And so I am optimistic, not very optimistic, but I am optimistic in, in their plans to further develop our country and to help our Bahamians grow in whatever field they, they decide to pursue. Like you said, I do think that they are moving in the right direction. I am optimistic, but you know, we still have been let down before, but they seem to be adhering to the promises that they've made. So I guess that's great. And I think the last time we spoke, we were talking about um, revenue being up. And Anise, I had said that it was because of the real property tax and the VAT. And Anise had said, well, they're taxing the poor people, you know, and she, which was a valid point. However, in recent times, and I think this was a few days ago, there was the economic affairs minister, Michael Halkidis, had said that the government has now is pursuing taxes in several high-end segments. And many feel, many of the rich, I should say, feel like it's a target against them. So real property tax has a cap on it. And I think the most was, yeah, $60,000. And it's now been raised to $120,000. So this may sound like a lot, but to put it in perspective, to get a, a bill of $60,000 on your home, your house has to be worth almost $10 million, right? So basically, if you had a $10 million house before, but a $10 million house. If you had a $20 million house before, you would only pay $60,000. The same way how a person who had a $9 million home would pay $60,000. So instead, they rose it. So the person who has, if you could have, they say, if you could afford a $20 million home, you could afford to pay $120,000. So a lot of people felt targeted by that. And Honorable Minister um, Halkidis said that they feel like this is more equitable instead of having someone who has a million dollar home paying such a high um, property tax and someone who has a $9 million home would be paying the same thing as them. I mean, obviously these people are still <laughs> really rich to be having these expensive homes, but basically they're trying to tax them what they feel is um, appropriate because they feel as though people have been getting away um, with the system. And also, they said that the, they're trying to clarify a law for foreign yacht charters to ensure that operators are paying, are going to pay the fees because apparently there's a 4% fee, but basically nobody pays it. So what they're trying to do is in trying to implement a VAT system where they have to register in order to come into Bahamian waters and they have to pay that tax. And they compared it to, I think, the Mediterranean, I think they said Mediterranean something. And the VAT there is 22%. It's 
if you want to enter their their waters, their harbors and stuff. So that's what they're aiming to do. They didn't disclose how much. They didn't say if it was going to be the same 4% or if they're going to charge more. But basically, people are evading these fees. They're enjoying our land and our, well, water, sea and stuff, and they aren't paying the necessary taxes. So, um, so the minister basically came to say that we're not trying to target, necessarily target the rich. It's just that these people are evading taxes as best as they can. Because if you could afford to have a yacht and charter a yacht, then obviously you've got money if you could own a yacht and, and rent it out, you know? So they're evading taxes. So they're trying to crack down on that. So do you guys think it's going to work? Do you think? Well, child, all I could say <laughs> is um, illegal stuff be happening on our waters all the time. I don't know if they could, I don't know no disrespect to any boss, but I don't know if they could handle another, you know, set of people to be watching on the waters. I mean, they may catch some, but they ain't gonna catch all. Yeah, that's I'm, ju I'm just glad. Yeah, I'm just glad they're making efforts. Like, for, okay, our country is a small country. We have a small force. So I'm not expecting the world. I'm not, for them to put this in place and, and actually have, laws to protect our lands i feel as if that's a good step in the direction of gaining some kind of revenue because like you said these people they have cash running running through their veins so it shouldn't be a big deal for them to pay our country for enjoying our our land and our seas and everything that that we bring to the table because when they go elsewhere they have to do that. So I think this is kind of, of putting our country out there and, and telling the world, respect us. You know, some may get by, some may get by and still, you know, do the illegal activities, but at least they would know now it's an illegal activity. And if they get caught, then they, su they suffer the consequences. So I think I, think I like what they do it is all I could say, because if people, if people, if poor people can't do it, rich people shouldn't be allowed to do it. It's not fair that the middle class and the poor man has to go into the food store and I have to spend 10% on everything that I pick up, but you could afford a mega yacht or um, you could afford a $10 million home on Paradise Island, a $20 million home and you can't you don't want to pay real property tax or you're upset because you're you're um it's being risen i mean that's i feel like it's a bit i don't know i don't feel like it's a target on the rich it's just it's just they're trying their best to get revenue and tax is a big way of getting that and a lot of people try to evade real property tax as well so i think it's a good start. I don't know if they're going to be able to be stay consistent with it because I'm sure when they implemented real property tax, they're like, yeah, this is going to bring in so much money. But over the years, people just stop paying it. Nobody is checking. So I hope that they that they stay consistent, they stay encouraged, and it works out. Because regardless, we're going to have to pay tax anyway. <laughs> That's just how countries make money. How to keep things running such as healthcare and all and education and stuff like that everything everything that we have that's so-called free comes at a cost technically so i don't think it's necessarily unfair because the poor man has to pay it or the person who has a home that's worth three hundred thousand dollars they have to pay real property tax so why is it okay for you to avoid it as someone with a million dollar property you know you know the main or the big thing is why people have all this stuff over here is because internationally we're known as a tax haven. So now, I mean, if rich people feel targeted, then I mean, what did you think they were doing taxes for? You can't, if you tax somebody who has no money, they can't pay the taxes anyway. But if you're rich or you, you or you're very affluent, I guess is the best is the best way to say it. If you're a very if you're a very affluent person, 
then it's kind of expected that you would pay more taxes than somebody who's not in the same situation as you. A yacht is basically a house on the water. Why would you think that you wouldn't be taxed for having a house on the water? You, I mean, you use it, you come into our, you come into our waters, you're not from here. If you come in, if you travel here, you have to pay to get in. If you want to come in on your sea home, then yeah, you should pay. You should pay to be allowed to come here because you're still, you're traveling. But if you feel, you know, if you feel some kind of way because you have a certain amount of dollars, then yeah, you should because you should be, <laughs> you should be contributing more. Your $20 million home is a lot more than my $10,000 home. I got to pay taxes on my $10,000 home on my little property. So it only stands to reason that you should pay taxes. But us paying a similar amount of taxes, us paying a similar amount of taxes makes no sense. So yeah, I think this is a really good idea overall. This... Okay, so since we're still on this financial, um, this financial wave, um, in this episode, I just thought that um, since we're still on even the the budget, the budget address was the big thing um, for this week. And according to Marine Resources and Family Island Affairs uh, Minister Clay Sweeting, they announced that the government is embarking on kind of on up, upcoming budget. Um, you know constructing new medical facilities on the family islands, expanding home ownership and decentralizing government services for residents outside of New Providence. And this was taken from the um, Eyewitness News. And I thought that this particular, this particular um, like section, these, these, particular aspects pinpointed a lot of things that have been going on um, in this country for years, but particularly the medical facilities on the family islands. I don't know if everyone recall, but you know, a few months ago in Long Island, they had that, they had that accident where the three guys were killed and one of them um, survived the crash. And it took a long time for him to get um, medical assistance in Nassau. And so I, for me, I am just loving all of this attention to detail that's actually been going on in the country. I feel like this is them telling Bahamian people that what, like a lot of times government goes inside there and they just say a lot of fluff and and say they're gonna do this and say they're gonna do that, but they never do anything. So for the budget to be to be focused on family islands, that's the thing that, that caught my attention, the family islands aspect, because I'm from Long Island and a lot of my family knew, knew um, two of the guys who died. And so I don't know if, I, everybody should have family in the family islands because it's family island. So, I feel like this was such a, a a relief, a burden taken off of of our, our behemoths that so often we forget about them if we're to be honest. And so I don't know any any you know any comments, any thing in particular that stood out to y'all in the budget because for me it was the family islands, whole and ownership. Like um, I saw the 18 year old girl who owned her first home and that was great to me, but for me. It's pretty yeah. accurate. I feel the same way too about the family islands. Cause like you said, a lot of us have family in the family islands. Most of my family that I'm close with live in Eleuthero. And, you know, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say Luther is some destitute place. It has 
it has facilities it has it but it doesn't have everything it doesn't like it doesn't have a hospital most family islands could say that they don't have a proper hospital if you get sick if something happens over there you have to get airlifted all the way over to nassau and regardless of how fast that response is there's always that period of time between that uh the helicopter getting there and then getting you here where anything could happen so developing the family islands is a cry that has been going on for years and years and years and it, it's always seemed like governments have done like little pe just enough you know they do just enough to quell the people there and then it's like all right but now we're still gonna have to focus on Nassau and providence because you know this is where the money is and this is where most of the people live I mean, so developing the family islands is an incredibly smart idea. It's one of the lowest hanging fruit that's existed in this country since independence. So the fact that they, the fact that they seem more committed to developing them is very good. We just have to, and I'm going to sound like a broken record saying this, we just have to wait and see so that we know for sure that they actually doing what they say they're going to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is because, you know, we, we'll let that, they'll say certain things, it'll sound so nice and so pretty, and then they never do it, and then we'll forget. So it's... I, I think now we're in a more, um, I think that Mahamian society is getting more and more critical of politics and politicians and the things that they say, which is a great thing. So we pay more attention now. We, we don't want you to just talk. We want, we want to see action. And that is across the whole spectrum. That's not something that's unique to younger Bahamians. All, all the Bahamians too are, uh, now getting to that point where I was like, hey, all my life you've been promising me something and ain't nothing happened yet. You gave me a little job, maybe, but ain't nothing else beyond that. I want to see more and I can't blame them for wanting to see more. I was going to say too, like also how at least said that when they would have certain issues, some patients would have to be airlifted here. I think if they developed the family islands, it would also contribute to like lowering the pressure of the frontline workers in the medical field who work on the family islands because of like the little resources they have in these clinics or the areas they work in they're only able to facilitate so much so if they have the resources that they need then they will be able to help these patients better and also like that will lower like the amount of patients that actually have to be flown into Nassau because our hospital is already congested to the maximum. So I hope that they do it like they said they would. I got it. Correct. And the, and the most important thing is how much lives would be saved if those islands were to have the care that they deserve? Because when you think about it, they too are contributing to um, our countries first. They too are the ones suffering just like us, even worse. Our gas prices just got up to six six dollars, and according to some family family islanders, it's been that price for them. So, for the longest periods of time, they've been suffering, and us on this on this capital thought we had it bad. But far too often, we forget about we as their families. We we even forget about them sometimes. So I think. I think that for this government to, to highlight that specific part of the budget for those family islanders, for me, I will, I will keep raving about it. That spoke volumes, just volume. Yeah, I think we, I think we suffer from forgetting our family though. Like that's kind of bad to us. <laughs> we get so yeah. upset. It's like, why is nothing happening in Nassau? And people on the family islands are like, everything is happening to Nassau. Can we get a Can we get the smallest crumb of help, please? please? I know, right? Like, Masa, Masa, can can I get a crumb off the table? And they oh, don't deserve that. <laughs> they really don't. 
not the master. Master. Not <laughs> even master. Master. That's how <laughs> bad we've been treating them. And they don't deserve it. Really, they don't. And with, like when it comes to life, I feel like people on the island could teach people in Nassau how to live easier lives when it comes to farming, fishing. Like who better to go to? Um, um, plotting the, the, the baskets, learning trades. They, they don't want to go to. But yet we still forget about them because, because they, they, they seem to be okay because, oh, they could farm. Oh, they could do this. Oh, they could do that. I think, I think we forget about them. Oh, they always sending down mangoes and they always sending down sapodillies and they always sending down this and that for the people in Nassau. But when we're going to start sending them things like, like, like medical assistance and stuff like that, I feel like if Bahamians, if Bahamians were to actually start not rioting, but protesting and demanding the rights of, of each and every one of our families, family islanders, and the needs that we need now, things could happen. When it came to the to the nursing issue, when the nurses were striking, although ev probably everyone in this country has a family or a friend, a loved one in the, the medical field here, only mostly nurses was, was down there protesting. Like we don't care about each other. And I, I even talking to myself because I wasn't down there either. And those people were busting their backsides off the beginning and even now in the pandemic and even before then suffering from not being paid all these radical foolishness that people abroad they don't deal with because people abroad they know the the value of their nurses they don't play around with their monies but we do we play around with, with people who we need. And so I don't even know how I got on that, but back to the, the family family islanders, if we were to stand up our people, we could see more change. And I, and I think that's, that's a big stretch for, for me to think that we would do that because we normally don't. That, that's just like not our culture these days, we're more laid back. But I hope one day we could get there. We could get there again. But Apparently this government seems to be on the right track. And I hope that us as the media, we keep demanding these things happen. And we keep demanding that they, we keep demanding accountability. We keep demanding that they actually do what they say with our money. But yeah, I agree that we have to take, we have to care more about our family islanders because not, the Bahamas isn't just New Providence. And a lot of past governments have neglected um, family islands, especially after hurricanes, and tell the people that the place isn't habitable. And some some islands, smaller islands at least, had to rebuild by themselves. And it sucks, but that's that's the attitude that our government and as Bahamians we have taken. Because I feel that in those circumstances, we should have fought harder, because we're all one you know and then also if you mentioned the 18 year old who had gotten the home i think it is in pinecrest and believe it or not i i've seen so many negative comments surrounding that whole thing and oh how she ate she 18 how she um how she what do you call it how she qualify and blah, blah 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 but if you watch the interview you would realize that her mother helped her so it's not like she just did it by herself which i'm sure she worked hard as well both her and her mother her and her mother work towards getting the, the home or whatever. But why are Bahamians so salty? Like, like, I don't understand. Like, be happy for the girl. Be happy that she got an early start and that she love a roof over her head, you know? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's the fact. I think sometimes envy, people take envy in the wrong way. It, it all depends on, on how you look at it. Like, for most, for the most part, when people, when people envy, or people, you know, they kind of like, they, they always want what someone else has. But the thing is, if that, when that thought comes 
all your mind is trying to tell you is that you you ain't really you ain't really um you aren't really um you know you're not happy with what you have and while that may be true it doesn't mean that you can't get what that other person has that just means that's the goal that you need to set for yourself and, and so even even that situation we just need to focus if we if if you see yourself and being against someone else, all that really means is you want what that person has. And so now you should say to yourself, hey, well, this girl, she was only 18 and she has a home. This is something that the government has made available for Bahamians. We, we know that. And so now if you're a Bahamian and you find yourself being jealous or whatever may have you, start aiming to that goal because now we see it's possible, you know? But this ain't about that. But I'm just saying. Now we we as behemoths we're we're being afforded the lives that we supposed to have. So let's take advantage of it. The very accurate Bahamian song says, "Dog don't bark at pa car. You can only stop barking when the car stop moving." So and young people are getting the opportunity to own a home. This is not the time to be weird. This is not the time to be angry at nobody. This is really a time to be there like yeah well that's incredible the government made a promise and they're living up to it so i mean it's I know, cool. right? we should all be cool Rant we should relax king. <laughs> yeah, kings kings are taking place are we, rare things are taking are place. we getting things <laughs> oh you know and and if it's one thing that i know about everybody who is listening to the sound of our voices if it's one thing that we all have in common as behavior we like things. Well, when I saw the the um, the car import budget, you know, being discussed, I was like, oh my, I'm electronic cars and the hybrid cars only getting dealt with. I was like, well, only rich behavior is going to be buying. Well, not rich, but, you know, they're going to have money to be buying electronic cars and hybrid cars. So I didn't like that part of the budget. I, I would have felt more included and I would have I would have thought that they would have included uh, more of the lower class in the in the country. They did up their heads, but it would have been nice. They didn't want to include you because the Bahamas is trying to slowly but surely go green, Bethany. And they know nobody's no. gonna be driving gas cars. So you gotta get you gotta get on board early. You should have bought a little boat. Uh, unless <laughs> unless they buy in or pitch in to get me to don't feel bad. I have to find an that being said government reducing duty on a couple of things is very nice. Next thing we'll get to is maybe we won't have to pay VAT on customs duty. Yeah Jay that makes no sense. How you paying a tax on a tax? Like huh? I don't it's no, it's been the biggest question on my mind since they first introduced VAT. And when they first introduced VAT, I didn't even care about politics. Now that I care, it's even, it, it confuses me every time. It's like, bro, what do you mean I'm paying 10? <laughs> what? So you taxed me twice? Wait. <laughs> it's the it's the biggest double dipping scam of all time. This is almost as big of a scam as owning a supermarket. All right. So with all this talking about the budget and thing, one of the main things that you might have noticed, I think we done mentioned it before, was the price of gas going up. But the price of gas ain't the only thing that's going up. The price of everything, quite literally everything has gone up. And I see I go combo from Wendy's is almost ten dollars. Ten I think it's like twenty cents off from ten dollars. So an Asiago combo is now ten dollars. It's harder to please people with <laughs> Wendy's now than ever before. And all of these things that are happening, the Prime Minister made a very made a very important point. Out of all the solutions that they have, <laughs> the there is no his words exactly, but there is no magic bullet. There is no magic bullet. But it but these things will help we are moving in the right direction. And I think it's important that we re that we keep in mind, you know, 
certain things that we certain things that we import and export because it was mentioned it was mentioned by the prime minister certain things that we import pays a pretty big bill and the things that we export ain't really covering that bill this man said that on importing food we spend hundreds of millions annually on importing food which is wild which is wild and which is why they're adding more of their resources and funds into agriculture but I just want to get your opinion on the current rate of inflation because it seems like every week everything going up in prices and <laughs> amazingly enough the amount of money that I am being paid is not going up at the same rate that inflation is going up so I'm very concerned I want to know how you all feel about that let me tell you something before before um the prices went up I had promised my brother I was like bro I'm gonna make you a lemon cake but I was like I'm gonna make you this after after school close suddenly I tell you no lie when schools when school in I don't really go to the grocery store I don't deal with that type of stuff a lot when school close that's that's where I be the minute I saw eggs was six dollars but for 12 for a dozen I said no sir no sir and that cake called for five eggs no sir that was too expensive then I went inside <laughs> the, the 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 aisle where the oil is I was like oh let me go check this price because I can need I can need the oil too I mean you know we behemoths we like oil I looked at the oil lesson oil for eight dollars. I was like, Jesus, not today, not today. I couldn't handle that. I was like, gas already expensive. And so now I about to just spend twelve that's that's twelve, almost thirteen dollars for two items. Two I can't, I can't, I can't, and I know most Bohemians can't. Yeah, and uh, and I heard they were talking about increasing the the wage, the what do you call that thing? Minimum wage to two hundred and fifty. Minimum wage yeah. from two ten to two fifty. What two hundred and fifty dollars would do? I mean, I know, and when you look at it in the economic um aspects, increasing oh, no, it. That's foolishness. Because the last one, no, no, wage, you have to it? think about it. The economics of it, if you increase it too high, then you will, the, the price is going to go up. Definitely no, because the minimum wage didn't change until 2015. Before that, I think the last time it changed was must be in the 90s. If every time the prices of things go up, if they increase the wage, we wouldn't have such a big wage, minimum wage versus living wage gap. Therefore, that really falls, I guess, on the government. And I feel like as a business owner, right, I don't know how you could feel comfortable paying someone $210. Like I can like I I can't fathom it. And so I wouldn't say it's an economic thing, you know, because the reason it it would be such a bad thing is because they wasn't raising it in the first place. It's now been 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. It's gone on seven years since we had a last um um in um an uh, increase in minimum wage because I remember when I was younger my grandma used to work for a grocery store and I'm making minimum wage is $190 and this woman was working for $190. I don't know how she used to pay any of her bills because her mortgage at that time was seven hundred and something dollars. I don't know how she used to pay it to this day making $190 and put food on the table like how you could choose I, what is this exactly so, I don't understand me I don't understand how so, to do it. So just so you get an idea of uh, what increasing minimum wage to 50 is, annually that would increase it to thirteen thousand dollars. Yeah. So the average Bahamian would, in one year of working for almost three hundred and sixty-five days, not including holidays, the average Bahamian <laughs> would make thirteen hundred dollars. Thirteen thousand. Do you know? Thirty, yeah, thirteen thousand dollars. My, I apologize. You'd make thirteen thousand dollars. Do you know how much thirteen thousand dollars could do? Not a lot. 
And the ec- the whole the economics is if the minimum wage increases by so much, then the prices of everything increases. We can tell that that is a lie. Okay. Because the price of living is going up. Yeah. Yeah. Prices of the price of living is going up regardless. So you know, saying that increasing the wage is gonna make it go up even more, more is like how worse can it get? <laughs> like how worse. Is it going to get re- really if we increase the price of minimum wage? We are the fifth most expensive country in the world to live in. So, you know, things ain't things tough regardless. You, you could you could let me feel like it ain't so tough. I don't know. I think we only look in at one one aspect of this whole multifaceted like issue because think about it these the most 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 places paying about 200 250 are low entry level jobs right when it comes to the jobs that young people want who you know they have all of these ideas they have these um innovative things they want to change in the country the jobs that they could get the jobs that they need to to you know secrete themselves in to make the living the living wage that they want are still occupied by by sometimes even I wouldn't say baby boomers but older people and those people don't want to let go their position and um what is his name the minister of the minister of the police and stuff oh what is that called National security. Yeah, national security. Um, the the what it was the commissioner just stepped down or something like that, and he was there raving about how he could just he gave up his power for the next person to come and this and that and that. You don't see that happen a lot in this country. When when those people have their positions, they stay there forever and ever and ever, and they do not let it up. And young people cannot get the desired jobs or the desired salaries that they studied to receive. And so I think a lot of things are are impacting the way people are paid because I think a lot of places wouldn't pay a cashier more than maybe $250 for, for doing the jobs that they do. Although I have been a cashier, I have been paid very, very, light but but those kind of jobs I don't see I don't see those people paying them four hundred dollars a week I mean I just don't see it I don't ever see it happening although Walmart Walmart is paid at people good now but we ain't in Walmart we ain't not so but this is my thing super value is a probably a billion dollar company right research has proven that when you pay your staff more you make more money. There's been numerous studies worldwide that have proven that. If I come into work and you want me stand up all day, you want me clean, you want me deep with people stink out of dude all day, and you want me about a, big, a big grin, but you want to pay me $200, your manager's yelling at me, barking at me, talking to me like I was a dirty dog, and you expect me to be good with paying that? And then they just wonder why people don't stay on these jobs. Most people just use them as a passing through type of thing, right? Um, and then what is killing me is older people like to blame us, the younger generation, the Gen Zs, or the young millennials, for instance, who 24, 25 and under, saying, oh, we don't have no stickability, we don't have no loyalty. But my thing is, I would rather be in an environment that's comfortable to me, even if I'm only making 250 or 300, whereas instead of a slave on somebody's job, 210, and do people stink out of food. Like, I don't understand what this be going to people head. Like, y'all making millions of dollars. Why y'all can't pay these people something reasonable? If I, the research that the university put out stated that it costs between 2000 I think, to $2,500 to live in the country. I ain't saying you have to pay all of that, you know. But my goodness, the comparison from $800 so twenty five hundred dollars is far too wide. You can't survive. Maybe if you was making eighteen hundred, you could hustle another six hundred, or you could share, um, share a, 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 an apartment and still live. But 
people minimum wage two people making minimum wage could barely survive in this country if even if they share an apartment sharing a car you forget the car they catch in bus it's still difficult for them to live so just like where's the empathy where's the sympathy why don't you care for these people and i bpsu um bpsu president what's his name Kimsley Ferguson had rejected the proposal and he said that a plan must be created to raise minimum wage incrementally over the next few years because 250 ain't enough and it's not a livable wage. Um, he said too many people today are actually having to make a decision whether to pay their rent or to feed their children. And that's not a, it's not a position that someone should be in. And it, he said that it was total rubbish and we need a better proposal. And I agree. Now I say raise people five hundred dollars right, right here, right now. But make a plan. Even if it's this year, you raise it to two fifty. The next two years, you try to get it to three fifty. Something like some clear plan. Because these people in parliament, most of them is millionaires. Most of them have houses behind nice gate. And we all get struggling the working class. We getting taxed to pieces. It's not fair. It don't make sense. And. I just don't see what I mean. I, I'm, I'm sorry. People be as behemoths and say, oh, I don't see it happening. Why not? Why can't it happen? It should It should happen, but we feel like it, like we don't deserve it. Why? And people's like, oh, it's an entry-level job. Just because entry-level doesn't mean no pay. Because as stuff, like infl as inflation increases and stuff, the prices of things rise, you can't expect the wage to be the same for 20 years over the past 20 years or the past 10 years, it makes no sense. And anybody who understands basic math would understand that with the way we live in, just it, it, it ain't not enough. I'm sorry. And nobody deserves to be struggling all the time. And people like to say, oh, well, go there and hustle, go there and start a business. Someone have to be the employee, point blank, period. Everybody can be an entrepreneur. If that was the case, then we would have no employees, we wouldn't have no Wendy's, we wouldn't have no McDonald's, we wouldn't have no food store because there wouldn't be nobody to work in the store. So stop making up these excuses and let's actually like get to the point where we could have a livable wage for, for, for people who work in, in these stores because they're important pillars in society. Whether we want to believe it or not, they all play a part. And where will we be without the cashiers? Where will we be without the pump attendants? Where will we be able without the Wendy's workers, without the janitors, um, and the gardeners, stuff like that? So I, I feel like it's just something that needs to be taken seriously, and we have to get we we have to get it there. And the two fifty two raising it is fine, but we can't just raise it and leave it. I agree with the BPSU president that we need to have a plan for the next five years as to how we continue to raise minimum wage because the gap between getting paid eight hundred dollars and a suggested wage for living in the Bahamas is twenty five hundred. That just don't make sense to me at least. But no, I, I mean, you know, Shanae, I, I really feel where you're coming from because when I think about it, um, I, my job pays me very, very well. And if you look at my bank account, like at the end of the month, you would be like, bro, are you getting paid? <laughs> so, exactly. and it, and it goes, cause it goes beyond, cause it goes beyond just, um, you know, we always start talking about a livable wage. It's like there are things that happen, like your car breaks down. You have to buy parts. You have to replace your car or you have to start catching the bus, which, you know, catching the bus isn't free. You you have medical you have medical things that happen all the time. Somebody fall down. Somebody got an older family member that needs medical assistance and that older person probably can't qualify for work their pension is definitely not going to be covering not going to be enough to cover their medical expenses so you have to pay for medical expenses you have to send children to school and if you're not going to send them to a government school pay for people's education education as well so that's our money don't forget that that's our money yeah, well, it's our yes, it's our money, but it, you know the government have it, so you call it the government money. But yes, you're right; it is our money. It's taxpayers' money, and it should be going by, and it should be being invested into us. However, the point still remains that there are other things besides groceries and gas that make it so that saying you will be able to live a good life, earning thirteen thousand dollars a year, makes no sense. 
if I get into a car accident tomorrow and I have to go to doctor's hospital, God forbid, that bill is going to be incredibly high for the care that I am going to receive. If I go to PMH, the bill is still going to be high. And then I got to fix the car. Or if I cause the accident, I got to pay for the other person's car. Or if my insurance cover it, my premium goes up. So there's so many, uh, you know, we could sit here and say, you know, well, groceries. Yeah, but there's so much more that complicates the matter that saying like, yeah, $13,000. Yeah, that's, that seems, that seems fair. It's not because the country is expensive at, on all levels. It, everything is expensive. <laughs> like everything is expensive. So 13000 uh, it sound, sound real nice. That sound really good, but it's not. 13000 sounds good for a month. Well, I never know yeah. <laughs> Oh, it don't sound good for a month neither because I got to pay taxes. I got to pay VAT. <laughs> I got to pay VAT. I got to pay property. I got to pay property tax. I got to pay BPL. I got to pay BC or live. Wait, yeah. wait. My time, is the, my time is the companies that I have to pay take my money. Then I turn around and say, yeah, but let me go buy some grocery. Egg and oil is $13. How are I doing that? Now? That mm -hmm. ain't even water. That's not even water. I cr I am. I have to go to the food store this weekend. I am already preparing myself mentally to buy water and sunshine. Because that's how I got to be. That's how I got to live. <laughs> Every time you step out your house, it feels like <laughs> you got to spend triple digit money to come back home. Because if you ain't spending that, then it's like, hey, bro, how are you going to make it to tomorrow? Very good question. <laughs> so, I mean, at some point, this whole complicated, I mean, and this is something that I don't know if I would say the government is struggling with figuring out the solution to, but <laughs> some got to shake, baby. <laughs> some got to shake. And, and at this point, it looked like that's something going to be me because. You can't do it, bro. You can't do it. Um, yeah, I was gonna say that I agree with Shanae was saying earlier about I think like how everything is becoming increasingly more expensive. Like everybody's solution is oh go start your own business or do a side hustle, but that type of like life isn't for everyone. And how Shanae was saying, like not everybody is meant to be a business owner and I think as we see like prices begin to increase more persons are becoming more like inclined to start their own businesses and then what ends up happening is that we have all these so-called business owners who are basically given no customer service that isn't a quality and it just becomes like a whole like domino effect so I don't know what would be like a uh, positive solution to say where all of us could come on the common ground because like at this time my prices are going to go up regardless but I just hope that like especially persons in the government as well like they can give another solution the persons either just say then oh just start your own business so I don't think that's fair that's not everybody's cup of tea Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Candid. We hope you enjoyed the show. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Candid242. We would love to hear your thoughts. Keep it real, Bahamas.